By now, you're probably eager to start coding, but first you're going to need a code editor. There's a lot of different editors out there, like Visual Studio Code, Emacs, and Atom. My personal favorite for PHP and web development is Sublime Text 3, so that's what I'll be using in this in future videos. There's a couple different ways to get this software on your virtual machine. You can use your web browser to find an installer, search for it in Ubuntu software, which you can find under Activities and Searching for Software, or clicking this icon here. Once Ubuntu software loads, click the search icon up here and look for whatever it is that you want and see if it has it. Which it looks like it does, under Sublime Text right here. However, in this video, we'll be using the terminal to install Sublime Text for practice. So let's go ahead and open up a new terminal window. From the terminal, we'll be able to download and install Sublime Text 3 with four commands. But instead of just having you copy pasting these commands and not knowing what they mean or do, I'm going to try to give a brief explanation of what each of the commands we're using does. Starting with wget or webget. First, verify that it's installed on your virtual machine by typing wget dash dash version. As you can see here, wget is already installed by default with version 1.20.3. If you don't already have wget, you can download it and install it with the command sudo apt install wget for Ubuntu and Debian operating systems, or sudo yum install wget for CentOS or Fedora operating systems. So what is wget exactly anyways? It's a tool for downloading files from the web, hence the name wget. You get the files from the web. WGET can use three different transfer protocols to get the data off the web and onto your local or virtual machine. The first, HTTP, stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is how unsecured web data is packaged to be sent over a transport protocol from wherever it lives on the internet to your local or virtual machine. The other two transfer protocols are HTTPS, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, and FTP, which stands for File Transfer Protocol, which, as the name would imply, is primarily used to transfer files, not just web data. I know all these different acronyms being thrown around can get pretty confusing. You've got IP, Internet Protocol, UDP, User Datagram Protocol, TCP, Transport Control Protocol, SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, TLS, Transport Layer Security, SSH, Secure Shell, and now HTTP and FTP. But wait, it gets worse. These protocols get encapsulated one inside the other, like a set of Russian nesting dolls. If at any point you feel the need to gain a better understanding for how some information gets from point A to point B, I'd recommend looking up the OSI layer model, where OSI stands for Open System Interconnection. In this model, there are seven different layers. If you have some information that a person A wants to transmit to person B over here, it starts at the application layer, which is then encapsulated in each of these different layers until it ends up at the physical layer. You can think of the physical layer as things that physically exist. This is the actual pipe that the information flows across which could be copper, like you would find on the inside of a coaxial cable, a fiber optic cable that light can flow across, Wi-Fi or Li-Fi. When the information arrives at its destination, any front and end matter corresponding to the layer below is removed and the information is passed up to the next layer, which is represented in this figure by the packets gradually getting smaller and smaller as it moves up the layers. Here's a nice color-coded example of what that might look like. Now that we've briefly touched on the theory, let's get back to the applications and take a look at the protocols that correspond to the different OSI layers. Up here at the very tippy top of the OSI layer model, we have our HTTP and FTP. 
But where's HTTPS, you might be wondering? It's actually there, but it's hidden. HTTPS is simply HTTP over SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, or TLS, Transport Layer Security. So what our wget command is doing is sending a request for data over HTTP, FTP, or HTTPS, which is then encapsulated into a TCP or UDP packet, then into an IP packet, an Ethernet frame, and so on until it's ready to leave your computer. That packet is then transmitted and received by the server that contains the information that you're requesting. The receiver removes all the different encapsulation belonging to the different layers, processes the request, and sends the information back, going back down the OSI layer model. So now that I've thrown an extremely quick introduction to packets and networking at you, let's go ahead and actually try using wget. So how does one even use wget? Since it has so many options, there are a lot of different flags you can set. To figure out which flags to use, I bet you could use some help. Dash dash help, that is. For many Linux commands, if you type the command itself, followed by hyphen hyphen help, it'll give you a description of the command, what it does, and a link to more resources. A command you can use to find out information about other commands is called the man command. To use the man command, just type man and then the command you want to learn more about, in this case, man wget. This brings up a page describing the command in question instead of simply printing it out to the terminal. Press Q to quit. Now let's go back to wget dash dash help and take a look at the alphabet soup that it printed out to the screen. These options you see here that are a combination of a dash and some number of characters is called a flag. The flag tells the command when running what your preferences are for certain things, like just how wordy to be when it's running. Dash D stands for debug. When you run the command in debug mode, that means it's going to print out a lot of information to the screen. This can be helpful when there's a problem and you need to troubleshoot what's going wrong. We have dash V and dash NV. That stands for verbose and no verbose, respectively. Verbose means just print out a whole lot of information to the screen. No verbose just means you can print out some bits of information, but not everything, maybe just the more important pieces. Dash Q means quiet. As the name would imply, it allows this command to run silently, not printing out information to the display. These flags are case sensitive. In the case of wget, the dash lowercase o flag is different from the dash uppercase o flag. If you're downloading multiple documents, dash lowercase o saves them to different files. Dash capital O concatenates them all together and writes them into one big file. Let's go ahead and do a quick example together. Starting by creating a new directory and changing to that new directory. In that new directory, we're going to go ahead and run the following command. Starting with wget, then the dash capital O flag followed by the name of the file, including extension, that you would like the command to save the data to. Next, tell wget where it can go to look for the data that you want it to download and save. For the purposes of this example, I'm using the OpenEMR code of conduct, which can be found in the master branch of the OpenEMR GitHub. Hit enter and allow the command to run. Since I'm only downloading a small file and have a pretty good internet connection, it was near instantaneous for me. If you're downloading larger files and maybe have less reliable of an internet connection, it can take some time to run. Since I didn't run this command with the dash Q quiet flag set, 
it defaulted to running in verbose mode. Let's delete the file we just downloaded and try again using the quiet flag set. Also, if you haven't already noticed, you can pull up an old command that you ran previously just by clicking the up arrow until you get to it. In wget, you can combine these flags together and write dash lowercase q, uppercase o. Hit enter to run the command again in quiet mode. Huh, the command didn't print anything. Well, that's good because it wasn't supposed to. But how do you know that it actually downloaded the file? Type ls to see the contents of the current directory. And there it is. This means we now have a local copy of the HTML that generates this web page right here. If you open up your file explorer and navigate to the new directory you just made, in my case, test dir, and double click to open in your default web browser. Now, if you look at what's in the address bar up here, you'll notice that it specifies a file in your home directory instead of somewhere off on the internet, like you see in this example. Although it may be worth noting that you can and will break some functionality of the web page if you're running it locally, as opposed to where it lives on the internet. Case in point, the page contributor list. It's completed here, but empty here. But what if you didn't want to open up File Explorer and navigate for the file you want to pull up and then double click and wait for it to launch? If you're lazy like me, you can launch Firefox to the file right from your terminal. Let's exit out of this browser window and I'll show you how. Simply type the command Firefox, file, a colon, and three slashes, the full path from home to your new directory, and last but not least, the file name, including the extension, in this case, .html. Hit enter and give it a moment, and there it is. However, what if instead of wanting to use the wget command to save information to a file, we want to download it and send it off to another command? For that, we can use something called the pipe operator. Also, a quick note, when I launched Firefox using the command, I have it running in the foreground, not the background which means it's taking up this entire terminal window. If I want to run more commands, I either need to launch a new terminal window or exit out of Firefox from here using the control C command. So let's try combining the wget command with a different command using the pipe. That's this vertical bar right here. You'll want to do wget dash Q capital O and since we're not specifying a destination, just put a dash here and type the file source. Now this vertical bar right here is called a pipe because it pipes the output of this command to the input of this command called T, T-E-E. -E. T is a command line tool that can be used to write data to a file or append data to a pre-existing file. T has its own set of flags and guidelines for using. If you'd like to know more, simply type man and T, like we did earlier with wget. But for now, all we really need to know is that it's taking the output of this command and putting it into a text file that I named test.txt. This file doesn't exist at the moment, so the T command will make it for us. Hit enter to run the command. You can use ls to make sure it created the file OK. And if you'd like to check out what's inside that new file, you can use the cat command, which just prints out what we already have pulled up. Now go ahead and cd back up to your home directory with the command cd space tilde. Now I'd recommend taking a quick moment to familiarize yourself with the act command. A good place to start is typing man space apt. apt stands for advanced packaging tool. You can use it to install new software packages, upgrade pre-existing ones, and even updating your operating system. Once you're feeling a bit more familiar with the apt command, go ahead and quit, 
and take a quick look at apt-key. Honestly, we could spend a whole video talking about keys. But basically, apt-key manages and stores the keys used by apt to validate the packages it downloads and installs. So, putting this all together, we're going to use the wget command to download the apt key from sublimetext.com. Then, pipe the output to this command, which is used to add it to the list of keys. You'll notice that on this side, this command requires super user privileges, so you may need to type your sudo password when you run it. For the next command, we'll need to use echo. What Echo does is takes in text and prints it out to the terminal or can be used to pipe into a file or the input of another command. So if I type echo hello world within double quotes and hit enter, it prints out hello world. So if you look at this next command, the echo will print all of this right here in between the double quotes and send it to the T command over on this side which creates the sublime-text.list file in this location and writes this line starting with deb to that file. And again, this side of the command requires super user privileges, so you might have to type your password if you haven't recently. You may recall from before when we were practicing with the T command, we didn't have to run it with super user privileges. We need to use sudo in this case because the file is located in a special protected directory. If you type ls, it doesn't show up as one of the folders, but you can still cd into it. However, the directory itself is write protected. That means you can't make new files or edit existing files without super user privileges. Watch what happens when I try to make a new file using the vi command. It opens the editor. But when I try to write, meaning save, and quit, it doesn't let me. But at least we can still view the file using the cat command. And as you can see, here is the information that was inside the quotes in the command above. Now the next command we're going to run is called sudo apt update. This command goes and looks for updates to current packages. This command does not actually upgrade your packages. You have to follow this command with the sudo apt upgrade command to actually get the new versions. Once that command finishes running, next you'll want to do the sudo apt install command on sublime text. Once that command is finished running, go to Activities and type Sublime to make sure that it installed correctly. When it launches, go ahead and right-click and Add to Favorites. This will pin it to the navigation pane on the left-hand side of your window. Now that we have Sublime Text up and running, we'll be all set to start coding with it next video.